Sounds good. So save your questions for the end. All right. So um, Scepter had invited me to come this evening to talk a little bit more about the work of changing perspectives, our partnership with San Mateo County Office of Ed, but then more specifically, what we did in schools over the last couple of weeks to support the efforts of Inclusive Schools Week. So a little bit more about me. My name is Sam Drazen. I am a former classroom teacher. I taught mostly at the elementary level, third grade, fifth grade. Um, I did do some work uh, in special education at the secondary level as well. Uh, and I left the classroom about eight years ago to embark on this new professional journey, which is um, being a presenter within school communities across the country presenting to parents, presenting to students, presenting to educators and administrators on concepts around equity, access, and most importantly, inclusion uh, of all students, but really using students as disabilities is really the entry point to this work. Um, and I also serve as the founder and executive director of a national organization called Changing Perspectives. I've thrown my email address up here on the screen. I'm always happy to connect with anybody outside of these uh, structured forums um, to talk more about you know, your particular situation, how I can continue to support you and your students. So a little bit more about changing perspectives. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And really the focus of our work is um, partnerships and collaborative uh, relationships with schools and districts across the country to support them in their work around both social emotional learning and this concept of creating equitable and inclusive learning communities really focused on or coming from uh, the need to be more inclusive for students uh, who identify as individuals with disabilities. Um, in the way that we do our work, we provide schools access to curriculum resources, educator professional developments, as well as family engagement workshops. Our website's up here on the screen. I encourage and invite you to check it out to learn more, as well as follow us on our social media platforms. I think one of the things that makes this a really unique opportunity is this hand-to-hand -hand partnership that Changing Perspectives has with San Mateo County Office of Education, as well as SACTA. So this really is a collaborative approach. This is multiple entities coming together, seeing the need for greater inclusive practices and recognizing that within each organization or entity, there's a variety of ways in which we can support to make that happen. Um, so I'm really kind of pleased and excited to uh, be in our second year of a contract with San Mateo County Office of Education to provide programs and services to any school within the county. Um, and really excited that this year we're able to, um, uh, with greater, I would say with greater intentionality this year, um, foster our relationship with SEPTAR um, and schools throughout Redwood City. So last week was Inclusive Schools Week. Uh, the Inclusive Schools and Network, which is a nonprofit that Changing Perspectives is a partner organization with, is based in Houston, Texas. And each year they promote a different theme of their Inclusive Schools Week. And for this year, the theme was the concept of unity within our community as we think about building and rebuilding um, our schools post the pandemic. So before I talk about what I did in the schools over the last couple of weeks and give you strategies that you can use at home to continue the conversation, I want to first talk about this concept of what is disability awareness, because inclusion is the outcome. Inclusion is our goal. But at the end of the day, we have to remember that inclusion is a feeling and inclusion is an action. And before we can accomplish an actionable change, or a change in feeling, 
we've got to start with awareness. We have to start with knowledge acquisition. acquisition. We have to start with common language. We have to start with common understanding. And so the way in which that I talk about that is through this concept of disability awareness. So disability awareness is a concept, a strategy, a methodology for talking about and engaging in an experiential learning where all students with and without disabilities come together to learn about disabilities. It is not an advocacy project. It's not where we're coming in to, to fight for equal access or equal rights. I would argue that advocacy efforts will be stronger if we start with awareness efforts, but it really is providing opportunities to bring a variety of folks together to share life experience, talk about how we're the same, talk about how we're different, and build common language around disabilities and differences. So why is this work important? Um, well, obviously I'm preaching to the choir because we've all chosen to dedicate some time this evening to join on this call. But disability awareness is important for a variety of reasons. Now, one, empathy is being noted as one of the most important 21st century skills. The ability to understand how someone else is feeling. Brene Brown unpacks empathy into four components. Perspective taking, staying out of judgment, recognizing connections and communications. And when we think about raising kids in the year 2022, all four of those components of empathy are crucial to lifelong success. In a world today where you don't need to memorize facts and figures like you had to when I went to school, because you can look everything up on your phone, you have to have those personable skills. You have to be able to understand other people. We also find that intolerance or bullying or social isolation or exclusion is oftentimes simply a result of ignorance. When a student doesn't understand another student and the other student is acting differently, speaking differently, learning differently, looks different, obvious, you know, it, it, you know when it comes from a place of fear, that's where intolerance comes up. And so if we can start to eradicate the intolerance by investing more intentional time and energy and resources in building an understanding and an awareness of disabilities, we should automatically see a decrease in the amount of um, bullying, social isolation, exclusion that we currently see in schools. And lastly, our communities are more diverse now than ever before. Disabilities are not always visible. Actually, a lot of disabilities aren't visible. And so we need to recognize that diversity isn't always just what it looks like on the outside, but that there's a lot of internal diversity in our learning communities as well. So awareness is essentially the foundation for empathy. And empathy is kind of the cornerstone for creating that inclusive change, those actionable uh, behavioral changes that we're looking for. So another way to illustrate, the, illustrate this is the model of the house. When you build a house, you build your foundation first, and that supports all the stories above. If we want students to be empathetic leaders of tomorrow, it's vital that we provide them with a strong and deep and solid foundation of awareness of differences, and that in turn will build a strong roof of empathy. I think a misconception about this work sometimes is that inclusion or inclusive practices or disability awareness is only for one population of students. It only helps one population of students. And for the educators on the call today, because I see a couple of them, I like to talk a lot about UDL, which is the acronym for Universal Design for Learning, which is essentially this idea, if we augment, if we modify, if we tweak something for one population, in this case, students with disabilities, it actually is gonna support 
all of the students. It's actually gonna enhance the whole educational and social experience of everybody in the learning community. And so I wanna just take a moment here and highlight that this work has outcomes for everybody, right? It's intentional that I put the word all in all capital letters. So when we invest time and energy in this work, everybody, regardless if you have a disability or not, develops greater empathy and perspective taking for others. When we talk about our differences, inevitably it helps us reflect on who we are, a cornerstone of social emotional learning, which is self-awareness. What are my strengths? What are my needs? And when we can better identify and articulate our strengths and our needs, that helps us feel more confident in who we are and what we have to offer the world. And when we're confident in who we are and what we have to offer the world, we're able to be a greater self-advocate, which is at the end of the day, all we want is our kids to grow up, live independent, successful lives where they can be their strongest self-advocate. So last week, um, and it did carry over into this week because there were so many schools that wanted me, which is great. Um, I had the pleasure of going to Redwood City Schools and presenting to students. And the way that I chose to design my presentation for Inclusive Schools Week was through the power of storytelling. I think storytelling is an incredibly um, powerful tool in building connections with students, in helping students feel safe, helping students feel comfortable in sharing about themselves. And ultimately, when we start a conversation about our differences, we end that conversation talking about our similarities. And the story that I decided to share with students was the story of my personal life and my journey as someone with a disability. And so up here on the screen, I just put a few of the pictures that I shared with the students at the schools that I visited. Um, and in the story that I shared, I talked about what it was like for me being born with a facial difference, undergoing eight craniofacial surgeries, uh, being someone who lives with a hearing loss, and then talking about what it was like for me in school, the positive experiences I had in school where I felt included, where I felt a sense of belonging, where I felt like I truly was able to participate, as well as the as what I would say to the kindergartners, the really sad stories where I didn't feel as safe, I didn't feel a sense of belonging. And ultimately helping all students really understand that we really each possess the superpower. And the superpower that we possess is the way we talk to each other, the way we behave really is uh, powerful in how it cultivates a community and recognizing what sort of communities we are aiming to cultivate in Redwood City Schools. Um, now for each um, school, I met with the principals ahead of time and I gave them a variety of options. Uh, each school was allocated about uh, two to four hours of my time. And so every school that participated decided to use that time in different ways. So some schools did you know, large assemblies with a whole bunch of kids. Other schools did smaller assemblies. Um, so it was really done in a very kind of customizable way to meet the needs of the school, as well as kind of the logistical and scheduling constraints that we were up against. I also worked with the school leaders to kind of pinpoint what are the specific themes that they were hitting home on. So for some schools, it was empathy. For other schools, it was kindness. For other schools, it was recognizing invisible, invisible differences. Um, in other schools, we're just celebrating differences. So based on what kind of the school was focusing on, I was able to kind of tailor my story to really reinforce those themes or concepts. So um, what I wanna do now is share with you a few of the pictures from the school. So these are some pictures from Clifford School. And Elena, you were there. I don't know if you want to say anything about that experience.
Yeah, I was fortunate to visit um, the day when uh, Sam pre was presenting. And what I noticed the most is kids um, were so curious and were so open to share their experiences and open to ask many questions. Like you see their hands raising all the time. Um, the presentations were awesome. I, I visited a couple of grades, different, different grades, and each grade level was different. How the Sam was presenting to younger kids was a lot more intimate and um, you know, with his teddy bear. Uh, and for the older kids was, you know, more, gave more information. So it was very different in each grade level. But the engagement was, was enormous. That, that was something that stood out to me. Thanks, Elena. Here are some pictures at Roy Cloud School. So you'll notice that at Clifford, we were kind of set up in um, a gym space. So we had, it was more of an assembly style. And here at uh, Roy Cloud School, um, I did some presentations more with smaller groups of students in, in classrooms or grade level visits. And then that was me in the upper right hand corner, uh, working with the, some students from the SDC class on their exercises. This was actually this morning over at Hoover School, um, and we were set up in the, the gym. Um, one of the things that was uh, unique about this is that there was a little more of transition time between as students were entering and leaving, so I had a chance to connect with a few students um, more kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, as they were leaving. And uh, there is the picture of the, the young man hugging me and it's that little reminder that we never know what someone's story is, regardless if they are identified as a student with a disability or not. And that this whole concept of sense of belonging, sense of inclusion, um, sense of feeling confident in who you are is not something that just happens at school. It's also something that carries over into home lives. And so it's just a little token of you never know what it is that's going to connect with or spark an emotional response from somebody. Elena, do you want to talk about, or someone else from SEPDAR, talk a little bit about some of the kind of the activities that were provided to schools? Um, I think Mary Khan is on the call and maybe she, I think that's her in the picture. <laughs> maybe she can say a couple of words about that. Oh, thank you. Well, I feel like we just had a really great um, experience at Hoover and we're gonna build on it for next year. And we built this little wall with hands, for, hands up for inclusion. Um, we did the superhero handouts to all the teachers and you can see one second I think it's a second grade classroom they really just love doing it the teacher said she actually made it like a two-day project for the kids and um, we're kind of excited to just make it a bigger and better inclusion week next year and our principal Lupe uh, said we'd like to see everybody get in a circle on the field and link arms you know and so we're just kind of brainstorming for the future and it was really great. We were, we did, it was really fun to be part of it. We put um, handouts in the teacher's boxes every day and intercom, um, you know, messages. And our teach, uh, our principals read a book to the younger classes every morning and it was really nice. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. Uh, the picture in the middle. It's from, um, I believe, a third grade class, to say, um, Miss Overby at Clifford. And I love, like, it's like a sun and each leaf um, they wrote about what um, they are and their strengths. It's kind of small to, to see, but each kid has, has their, um, 
different superpower and and you know how beautiful is that um the picture uh, on the left uh, the lower one is from roosevelt and i'm not quite sure uh i don't know how to describe it maybe michelle knows a little bit michelle uh, yeah, I know. Um, I think that might have been the art teacher. She was doing uh, projects with the kids, and that was their wall of inclusion. I'm not. I, I we were very disconnected from everything last week, so I'm not sure um, exactly what what they were doing. But I think they were like drawing pictures of themselves. Maybe um, I don't think anyone from those adults on the call, but um, but. Yeah, that's, that's, and, that's and what that was called. So this is just a handful of pictures I got. Not every principal email does their pictures. And I know there's, there's a lot going on at Roy Cloud, which I, I, I can't really show you, but I don't know if Jeannie wants to say a couple of words what was going on at Roy Cloud. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I do with my daughter is just a lot of uh, reflection at the end of the day. And so, um, she had told me that she was really excited about Sam's presentation on Monday, and then she told me about the other activities that they planned, and I know that Miss Lara uh, read another book about disability. I'm not really sure which book it was. I do know last year it had a pretty big impact on my daughter. She said, oh, that, that girl in that story sounds a little bit like me, and so where she was finding the relatability with um, with what was being read and and feeling comfortable that there was some representation of within the literature um, of, of someone like her. Um, and then I know she did the disability scavenger hunt. At least she told me she did it on Thursday and she was really excited about that. I believe it was in the cafeteria. I'm not sure she followed through with it the next day. But um, what I'm gathering from her is, is that it's having a very, big impact on her own self-esteem and how she sees herself in the world and the community at Roy Cloud. That's pretty much it. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Um, yeah, this awesome things were going on last week. And I would encourage you if there's parents on this call who had kids who saw my presentation at any of the schools I went to, to, you know, ask them what they learned, what they thought of, what connections they made, and what next steps might be for them. So now that we've talked a little bit about who I am, changing perspectives, our relationship with San Mateo County Office of Education, SEPDAR, Redwood City Public Schools, um, and the work that uh, I had the privilege of doing in the schools last week and this week, what I wanted to do tonight was give you all as parents some strategies for ways you can continue this work at home. Um, I think Inclusive Schools Week is great. My only hesitation about it is that it's called Inclusive Schools Week. And I think there's that concept, right, that the week has culminated and now we just go back to regular life. And so how do we emphasize and encourage and recognize that Inclusive Schools Week is a week where we pay a little extra attention to this work, but actually this work doesn't happen just one week a year. So the first thing that I wanna talk a little bit about is how this work of inclusion is actually what I would call social emotional learning. So when we think about inclusion and inclusive practices, at its core, it is SEO. And the reason I say that is, again, there's this misconception of inclusion or inclusive practices is only for students with disabilities. Well, it's actually for everybody, but I think a more universal way to consider it is social emotional learning. So one way to really just think about in continuing this work is thinking about self-awareness. Part of Inclusive Schools Week isn't just recognizing the differences in others, but it's also an opportunity to think a little more deeply and reflectively about us. 
And so within the, uh, the social emotional learning competency of self-awareness, there's a few things that we really help students consider and develop. So one area is helping our kids reflect on both their strengths and challenges. So what are you good at? What are you trying to get better at? And oftentimes our challenges ultimately become our strengths, right? So it's constantly changing. This is not something that is a one and done. Even as adults, we are constantly reflecting on what's going well for us, what do we need to do a little bit better on in our lives? Self-awareness is also about identifying emotions, being able to articulate, I am feeling X, Y, or Z emotion because of an X, Y, or Z situation. And I think when we consider inclusion, that really plays into emotions. Because part of inclusion is meeting people that are different from you. And sometimes when we meet people, or interact with people that are different from us, it can give us some emotions. Sometimes we're nervous. Sometimes we're anxious. Sometimes maybe we're a little scared because we're just not really sure. And so helping and take the time to let our kids identify emotions is so important. And giving them scripting and prompting is sometimes what they need. In the world we live in right now, our world is incredibly complex. And I feel like as adults, we often try to like pin our students or pin our kids to be like, you can only be experiencing one emotion, right? So if our kid's upset or happy, it's like, well, what are you feeling? And they give us one emotion and then we go, okay, we move on. What we need to recognize is that a lot of times, especially in the complex world we live in today, kids are feeling more than one emotion at the same time. And that's okay. So it's not just what are you feeling, it's what emotions, plural, are you feeling right now? Giving our students the permission that it is okay to feel more than one emotion at the same time. Self-awareness is also developing a growth mindset. Growth mindset is the opposite of a fixed mindset. So a fixed mindset might be, oh, I'll never make any friends. Uh, I'll never get 100% of my multiplication times tables. Uh, I'm never going to memorize all the states and their capitals, right? That's a fixed mindset. Whereas a growth mindset is, tomorrow I'm going to talk to one new person at recess. Tomorrow I'm going to ask my aide if they can help me make a friend. Tonight I'm going to practice my multiplication flashcards. That's a growth mindset. And again, that's universal to everybody. And lastly, recognizing our sense of identity and purpose. That's really important for both students with and without disabilities. Feeling and understanding and being loud and proud about what your identity is, is hugely powerful in lifelong success. And I like to imagine that we're all made up of what I call an identity puzzle. So if you imagine the outline of your body and it's made up of puzzle pieces, right? And each piece is a component of your identity. Now for students with disabilities, we don't want them to omit their disability. That is a piece of who they are. It's a piece of who they'll always be. But we need to recognize that it's not the only piece that makes up their identity puzzle and give them the time and the space and the permission to consider what are the other pieces of their identity puzzle. Purpose is also really important. And recognizing that purpose varies based on place and space. So you may be a student who struggles with dyslexia. So in you know reading class, you're kind of feeling who you are, but maybe you're also the star quarterback on the football team. So on the football field, you have a different sense of purpose. And so recognizing that purpose is very relative right? Even in our adult lives, right? Like our purpose at our job may be very different than our purpose in our home life. Our purpose with our immediate family who we live with in our home might be different than our purpose in our extended family. And so helping our students recognize that. A 
Another component of self-aware, uh, of social emotional learning is also this idea of self-management and recognizing how do we take all the things that I just talked about, about who we are as people, the adjectives, how do we put them into action? How do we take those adjectives and turn them into verbs? And so this idea of not just identifying our emotions, but being able to manage our emotions to keep our body and our heart and the hearts and bodies of those around us safe at all times. Recognizing that in life, you've got to be motivated. If you want something, you've got to figure out a way to make it happen. Helping set goals for ourselves, even if those goals are a goal for an hour, a goal for a day, right? But success brings success. We build confidence when we feel that we are successful or we're able to accomplish certain things. So how do we help our kids build that intrinsic motivation, set those goals, and how do we celebrate when those goals are achieved? So that's kind of like some universal ideas there around this idea of adults, um, parents, caregivers, educators, how do we keep the conversation going? And some of those bullet points within self-awareness and self-management under the umbrella of social emotional learning are ways that we can keep the conversation going. But sometimes we need something to help spark the conversation. And so up here on the screen, I put some uh, examples of feature films and TV programs that can sometimes help spark the conversation. So part of what we did or part of what I did in the schools was spark the conversation about my difference. And by talking about my difference, students started sharing about what makes them unique, what makes them special, their own strengths, their own challenges. And so videos and movies can be a way to do that. Um, now, some of these are more appropriate for different grades than others, but um, CODA, I don't know if anyone has seen that yet. That was um, won a whole bunch of awards last year. That's definitely going to be more for adults or high school students, maybe middle school students. Um, but if you haven't seen CODA, I would highly recommend it. Um, the acronym CODA stands for Child of Deaf Adult. So it follows the story of the daughter here in the family, who is the only um, person in the family that hears and everybody else is deaf and kind of the role that she kind of has to take. Um, I think if you're a parent and you have a kid with a disability and a kid without this could be a really cool um, video to help kind of tune in or help you maybe be a little bit more aware of the lived in life experience of your child without a disability. Atypical is definitely more middle or high school. Um, and that is on, I think it was a Netflix original. Um, and that follows the story of a young man who lives with autism um, and kind of his journey uh, through school, socially and emotionally. Best summer ever, you might not have heard of this one because this one was a little bit more of a uh, smaller production, I guess, um, or an independent film, I guess they call them. Um, our best summer ever is great. I would say fifth grade and up, it's pretty appropriate for. What's cool about best summer ever, it's the story of these teenagers that go to a summer camp, but every character, has a disability and all of the actors and actresses in the film live with that disability. Um, Speechless was a ABC sitcom a few years ago. That's probably good for as young as third grade. Um, I don't know what platforms that's still on, but it's the story of a family with three kids and their oldest son, JJ, lives with cerebral palsy. A um, lot of great kind of conversations around ableism and ableistic perspective in there. Um, Wonder is a great movie too. Again, that's pretty universal for most uh, ages. Um, but again, if you start Googling any of these titles, I'm sure Google will start showing you other titles that are relevant as well. Books are also a great way to spark the conversation. Um, in the last probably five years, we've seen a huge increase in the number of publishers that are publishing both chapter books and picture books that feature characters with disabilities. 
Um, so up here on the screen, I just put a few um, to get you thinking. I'm not going to kind of run through all of these, but you know, you're welcome to take a picture of this screen. Again, if you go to Amazon and you type in any of these titles, you'll quickly go down that rabbit hole of finding other books that are related. Um, but if you're doing picture books at bedtime, that could be great. Um, chapter books, get them as audio books when you're sitting in traffic or driving around, like just be listening to it. Um, a few that I might draw your attention to, How Katie Got a Voice um, is the story of uh, a, a young child who does not speak using her mouth, but using an AAC device. And so that's the story of when she gets her device and how Katie now has a voice. Um, Fish in a Tree is a chapter book for young adults um, around dyslexia and what it's like to live with dyslexia. Um, on that same vein, The Alphabet War is a great picture book uh, about what it's like to live with dyslexia. Um, and then the thing about Georgie, uh, that's a great chapter book about uh, uh, a kid, Georgie, who lives with dwarfism. Um, so tons and tons of books out there. Um, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me if you want um, a more specific book list. I also know that, Elena, do you want to talk about the really awesome visual interactive library that you put together? Is that, on, is that available to everybody? Yeah, I have actually the link right here. I can put it in the chat for everyone. Um, yeah, I just want to say that I just put it in the chat so you can um, maybe I, should I share my screen or something? <laughs> I don't know. Um, um, Sam, do you think it would be okay if I shared my screen for a minute? Oh yeah, or do you want me to pull it up? Sure, yeah, you can, can you open it? There you go. So um, there are books in Spanish and English that I also included, oh yeah, that's just two pages of that as, um, so this is, this page is about um, disability heroes and behind each picture, there's a video that you can click on each one and watch a video about that person. Um, and also behind each book is a video as well. Um, it's um, YouTube, I converted it into a safe link. So you have to click a couple times. So there's no ads. I made it for teachers. Um, so they don't have to use YouTube. Uh, and also all of those um, carpet figures are also links that you can click on. Everything's a video and um, there's the short film Ian and Float. Unfortunately, Float is not available for free anymore. I think it's Pixar and they um, you have to buy it somehow. But it, those are two really great movies, you know, short movies to watch uh, with your kids. Um, there's a con it's a co collection of books about different disabilities. Uh, autism is a very popular topic. And All My Stripes is about autism and the girl who, who's having pictures and uniquely wired. And actually Why Johnny Doesn't Flop also is about autistic um, boy who doesn't understand why his friend doesn't flop when he's excited. Um, and then there is there's some Spanish books also about autism and Down syndrome. There's a book We're All Wonders is a picture book on the Wonder Wonder book, um, the shorter version of it for younger kids. And the, the uh, books about Down syndrome are on the top. 
the three the three top books and then there's um a couple of books about physical disabilities on the top as well and i think a lot of those books were read at the roy cloud um at roy cloud last year and they were very well received yeah so um if you have time please go through this library with your with your um kids at home So another strategy to spark conversation is by following some social media influencers. Um, this has gotten really big in the last couple of years. There's a variety of social media influencers out there that share their story um, or share the stories of others. Um, and so up here on the screen, I've just put a few. But again, as you explore these, others will come up. Um, um, this, this mom, uh, she's in Texas, I believe, and uh, her son uh, was attacked by a dog when he was younger um, and lost one of his legs. And so he lives as an amputee um, and she shares his journey. Um, Finding Cooper's Voice, I don't know if anyone has seen that one. That one is you know, 969,000 followers. <laughs> she's gotten really big. Um, sharing her journey as a mom of her son, Cooper, who lives with autism and is nonverbal. Uh, special books by special kids. Um, if you haven't followed that one, that's great. It's a former special educator who travels the country or the globe and sits down and interviews and has conversations with kids and adults with really a range um, of differing abilities and or disabilities. Um, and then the, the last one on the far left there, um, is an individual who is blind and deaf um, and shares, you know, her journey um, as living in a world uh, in that way. Um, so lots of good resources out there. Um, don't hesitate to, to explore them, to check them out. Um, and also, if you want more specific ones or if there's something more um, unique that you're looking for, reach out to me um, and I may have a resource for you. I'll also put a little selfish plug for my podcast that I'm doing um, through the Supporting Inclusive Practices Project, which is funded through the California Department of Education. Um, so I will throw that link in the chat as well. But that's what I wanted to share with you all this evening. I'm happy to kind of open it up to general sort of conversation or specific questions you have or feedback about, you know, what your kids experience as part of Inclusive Schools Week. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, please uh, unmute yourself if you have a question. We have a good amount of people joining the board, joining the meeting today. We have a board trustee, Mike Wells. Welcome. Mike, thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, thanks. Thanks. And sorry I'm late. And Sam, thanks so much for participating in our Inclusive Schools Week. I know you got to speak at a couple of schools. You might have covered this before. I was at another meeting, but what 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 did you cover when you actually went into the schools and and talked to the students? And what was that sort of reception like? And if you've already covered it, I'll watch the recording. You don't have to repeat yourself. Um, I yes, I did already talk about that. Awesome. I'm going to watch the recording then. Thanks. Awesome. And then if you have follow up questions, I'm more than happy to hop on another call and and, and talk about it. Sam, I have a question for you. You had said that like Inclusive Schools Week is just one week earlier and you talked about like the um, how do we keep the conversation going within the schools and within our communities and just some thoughts or ideas that you might have about, you know, continuing the conversation and, and where it's like this is not a one and done, right? This is a continual evolution of how we bring um, equity and justice and disability awareness into um, into the Redwood City Schools. I think one of the things we have to think about a lot is like, what's the actionable outcome? 
you know, I think with any sort of awareness week or awareness month, um, there tends to be a lot of, you know, activities that happen that week or conversations that happen. And I think, you know, and this might be something to think about for next year is maybe a project for the schools is what happens next week, right? Rather than it just kind of ending. Um, what is the carryover? Um, I think, you know, encouraging kind of the, the videos that I showed, the social media influencers, I think it's really about looking for those really simple um, and easily to embed strategies to keep that conversation going. Um, now, easier said than done, because, you know, they run Inclusive Schools Week at the beginning of December every year. Then it's holiday concert time. Then it's holiday vacation. And then, you know, you've got January, February, March. And by April or May, we're doing standardized testing. And we're thinking about transition plans for next year for kids, right? So we have these little sort of windows of time. Um, I might almost encourage schools to really think about, okay, inclusive, inclusive Schools Week is in December for a whole week. But what's one day we could carve out in January? What's one day we could carve out in February? What's one day we could carve out in March? to do something as a follow-up, whether that's everyone watches the movie Wonder, whether that's inviting other guest speakers to come in, whether that's the school hosts their own disability awareness event, right? But like think about Inclusive Schools Week as we plan it isn't just a week, but it's a week plus these other isolated opportunities that happen later in the school year. Because Mar I think March is Disability Awareness Month. And so I know like in some schools, what they'll do is they'll do, you know, in a, like a lot of the school libraries, they have like a display of books. I've worked with a lot of librarians. It's like, all right, the, Mar the month of March, your display should be all the books that Elaine and I just showed you, right? Like that's an easy way to bring back the conversation. I also want to add that some of our schools have SEL curriculum kind of embedded for an everyday routine. And um, maybe we can encourage to having a disability conversation within that curriculum as well. So like, see like how much disability videos are actually in, in those curriculums? Sorry, was that a question for me? No, just question oh. for everyone to like the leaders of schools and um, maybe you know, even um, our parents can ask their teachers like um, those questions. Yeah. Well, and I was just gonna say too, I think a lot, a lot of ways that we bring this in is, you know, a lot of schools or districts are doing DEI work, diversity, equity, inclusion. That's like a big buzzword. But yet in a lot of districts, disability is devoid of that conversation. But yet disability is the largest minority in the world right? And recognizing the intersectionalities between individuals with disabilities and other marginalized groups. So I think that's another tie-in is like, you know, how is disability a part of your greater DEI conversation? Yeah, Sam, that um, is a great point. It was actually something I had talked or made a note of is um, talking about that intersectionality to try and get more community engagement. Um, when there can be some sensitivities that need to be taken into account and um, getting people to be more comfortable talking about disability. Um, I know myself as a, as a parent, people not being sure and clumsy about language and hesitant from adults, right? Kids, maybe less so, they sort of say things and they're not worried so much about using the right verbs um, or adjectives, but uh, how do we have those conversations? How do we begin to think about the intersectionality um, with disability? I think it goes back to, I just did a training actually for, for a similar group like yours up in Marin County last year, or not last year, last week. And it was titled The Intersectionality Between Disability and DEI. And I think it goes back to this idea of the identity puzzle. Right, It goes back to this idea that students with disabilities aren't just in one category as a student with a disability, but they could be in 
you know, they're a student with a disability and they're ELL, they're a student with a disability and they're uh, of a certain ethnic background or racial background or socioeconomic group, whatever it is. So I think the larger conversation is how do we move away from this idea of a student with a disability and that's their only piece of their puzzle to what are all of the other sort of multiple identities that make up not just students with disabilities, but like make up all of us, right? Like we do tend to like, you know, you know, even like you fill out an informational survey, right? It's like your gender, your age, your that like we compartmentalize each uh, component of identity. So how do we start to weave it all together? We have a question in the chat uh, from Katie Parvinchuk. Uh, how should parents educate themselves on what is required by law for inclusion and in schools? Me? Do, is that, would that be a good question for you? Me? You on the spot. I, I was going to jump in and I was waiting, Sam, in case you wanted to answer. Thank you so much for your message, Katie. Um, I... You know, probably I, I'd be happy. I'm the director of special education in case any of you I haven't met already before. Um, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you um, separately, like a conversation about um, inclusion and inclusive opportunities and um, yeah, just a broader conversation or maybe a specific conversation um, to your child. But um, in general, the law talks about the least restrictive environment. And so the starting point for the least restrictive environment for all children is general education. And um, then we move, say, along a continuum to maybe I'm in general education for part of the day and in a more supportive setting for um, part of the day, like a blended program. Or maybe I'm completely in a separate setting, often called a special day class setting for the whole day. Um, or maybe I'm in a program not in my neighborhood school, in my district, I might be in a non-public school program. So it kind of moves the whole way along a continuum. In our district, um, at each school site, um, we kind of offer a range that will be specific to the child. Um, usually in these meetings, we don't talk about individual children, but I'd be more than happy to talk to you about your child. I know that at the preschool level this year, one of our big goals has to be, um, we moved all our preschool programs from one single location to um, four different sites. So they're beside our child development center program. So we can start moving towards inclusive practices at the preschool level. And um, some of that work has happened this, this year, but that's a process, a, a real goal um, to work on, continue to work on in the spring. Um, should I put my number in the chat, Katie? And I would just echo, Maeve, you read my mind, because the first thing I was going to say to Katie was research least restrictive environment, or the acronym LRE. I think that's a really, really good starting place as a parent. If you can go into the school and have um, a, a solid understanding on LRE and least restrictive environment, I think that's a really great kind of uh, jumping up point to the conversation for your particular child. I also want to suggest um, to go to our scepter page and we have resources. I'm going to put it in the chat. And we have a presentation by um, Kevin Schaefer from last year. And he created a whole Padlet with resources on uh, inclusive education and inclusion. And there's a lot of information there. I'm also happy to chat with you um, separately because I'm a big proponent of inclusion and all our SEPTA members are. So we, we are happy to have that conversation as well. Um, it looks like Katie has her hand up. Yeah, Katie. Katie Perea. Buenas noches. Oh, bueno, bueno, eh, gracias. Se está hablando mucho sobre crear conciencia. Yo tengo una pregunta. 
referente a las aulas que tienen los grados de primero a quinto o a sexto grado, que solo tienen dos aulas, eh, ¿es una manera de que el distrito crea conciencia para juntar a todos los alumnos de primero a quinto o de primer grado a sexto grado? ¿Cómo crea conciencia a un entorno menos restrictivo y a una inclusión? Um, Nora put in the chat um, the translation for that. Um, says how um, regarding grades two through five, is this awareness to lump them together? How is this inclusive? So, Kay, let me just reiterate back your question. Is your question if students are lumped together in multiple grades? Is that inclusion? Oh, is it referring no, no, to no. day class? Eh, se está hablando de crear conciencia, ¿verdad? Referente a la inclusión de educación especial o niños con discapacidad con los niños regulares. Yo le pregunto al distrito, si ahorita se está hablando de crear conciencia, ¿Cómo es posible que junten del grado, primer grado a quinto grado en, en dos salones? ¿Sí me entiende? Esa es mi pregunta. Estamos hablando de crear conciencia. Entonces, ¿cómo es que el distrito este, da, ¿no? O da el soporte suficiente a una educación apropiada a los niños de educación especial? Um, May, do you want to speak to that? Yes, yes. Gracias por su pregunta, señora. Thank you for your question. So in general, the children who are in multi-grade classrooms are not in an inclusive setting. So those classrooms in our school district are usually kindergarten through second grade, third through fifth grade, and sixth through eighth grade. And the reason several grades are put together is to maximize resources and the type of specialized services that a child might be getting. So generally, we don't say have enough kindergartners to have a separate kindergarten intensive program or enough fourth graders to have a separate fourth grade intensive program. But we do want children to be able to stay at one site where possible from kindergarten through fifth grade rather than going to Adelante for kindergarten and Roosevelt for first grade. Um, so we have, um, we do the multi-grade classroom um, so that we can maximize our resources and keep children um, on, a, on the same site for their whole uh, elementary school career. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? I also want to add that um, the students who are in special day classes, they can also um, go for inclusion time in the general education classes. Um, you know, you have to just um, kind of meet with your team and decide how much inclusion time your kid can have. And sometimes it's 50%, sometimes it's 20%, depends on the day and the schedule. So you can definitely uh, advocate for that, for inclusion in general education class, even though your child attends special day classes. Gracias. Gracias, señora. Y si quiere hablar más, por favor, llamarme por teléfono. Mi número por teléfono es en el chat. Gracias. Any more questions? If you want to unmute or put in the chat your question, we are happy to um, to to um, to make it accessible for any way we can accommodate questions. We are doing really well on time. We have like twenty more minutes left. 
Mike Wells, do you have any questions? I have a feeling that probably many of them were answered in the first half hour before I got here. So I'll. Uh, sorry I'll, about that. Yeah, no, that was my double booked time. So sorry about that. It's okay. Maybe Sam, you want to recap just very shortly, like what you are visited at the schools. Elena, can I just ask a question about hey. regarding special education and general education? I'm wondering, like, if we're trying to say we're inclusive, then why do we keep creating separate classes or separate situations for students with disabilities to be to be in? Why are we not considering that the gen ed is actually the first option. And then we can individualize instruction based on each of those individual childs within gen ed, within a gen ed setting. Uh, SDC's separate classes has nowhere in the law. And so we've created this structure in the state of California where we're saying we need to have SDCs, but maybe we should actually reconsider how we're actually starting from the get go for kids that have um, disabilities and IEPs. And I'm just wondering why we still continue to segregate students into SDCs based on that they have a disability. So uh, I think that's just a much bigger, well, Jenny, you've been to a lot of my trainings. <laughs> uh, but like, I would say that that is a much bigger conversation and more of a mindset issue, right? And for those that have been to other presentations where I've talked about the difference between the medical model of disability and the social model of disability. And that the reality is the public schools in this country were designed with a medical model lens. And even though we're having a lot of conversations around the social model of disability, our system is still so rooted in the medical model that it hasn't shifted yet. And so I think so much of where it begins right now is mindset shift. We have to shift the mindset of teachers. We have to shift the mindset of educators. We have to shift the mindset of administrators, of students, of parents, and everybody to move in that way. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the medical model of disability is the idea that if someone has a disability, the goal is to fix them, right? Like the medical model, if you're sick and you go to the hospital, you get medicine and you leave the hospital and you're fixed, you're cured, right? So the medical model of disability is this perspective on focusing on fixing an individual with disability. And when we focus on fixing, we focus on shame and pity rather than what we've been talking about today, which is celebrating differences. Whereas the social model of disability is not seeing disability as the problem, but it's looking at what are our current limitations? What are our current structures? And how do we change society to be more inclusive to those with disabilities rather than changing someone so they don't have a disability anymore and they just fit into the society that we've already created? So I think it's a great point, Jeannie, and a much larger, more universal kind of societal um, conversation. But for those who want to look more into it, I, I would suggest researching the medical versus the social model of disability because it can help kind of theorize it for you. If I may add to your amazing explanation, um, I have a child with, let's say, severe disabilities, and I have been advocating for him since he entered kindergarten to be an inclusive, inclusive setting. And I feel like I've encountered so many um, barriers along the way and like from let's say an environment that's very welcoming and very um with a great inclusion mindset but there is still barriers like let's say teachers not quite sure 
how to adapt the instructions for him, how to make modifications for him to be in, in, in the general education. So it's it feels like we all have to be educated, like not just a principal, not just the, the director of services, every teacher, every general education teacher, every special education teacher should know how to support kids with extensive support needs. Every parent have to be on board. Like it feels like, yeah, it's a societal change that has to happen. And, and we as parents, we have to be the biggest advocates for our kids and just kind of push that barrier away. And um, it, it gets exhausting. After a couple of years, I'm exhausted. I feel like I'm almost giving up, but I keep going. I feel like if we are going to work together, we're going to be stronger and we try to get to, to, to get through those barriers together. But where do we start? Where do we start like as a district, let's say? Like, because I've seen like some districts do better than other districts. Like our district still has a lot of SDCs. We still have like, do we offer the kids general education as the first option? Do we have that or do we have like, no, 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 severe disabilities only go in this SDCs. Like, you know, like what, how can we move forward as a district? No, it's it's a huge question, but yeah, we we can work 